Welcome to the next lecture on human genetics. Please don't distribute. And so you may be asking yourself why we are doing a lecture on human genetics within a genomics class. And the reason is that in the field of human genetics, uh, a lot of the focus previously has been on identifying genetic variants associated with different complex traits, uh, characterizing the heritability of different complex traits, uh, and in general, uh, interest in, for example, predicting complex trait phenotypes from genetics alone. Uh, what none of those previous studies were able to do, though, is actually give some kind of mechanistic insight into how those genetic variants work. Right? And so you can identify um, you know, hundreds of genetic loci, for example, associated with height. But you know, one of the most important questions is how, how do those genetic variants that, you know, even if you find a causal genetic variant for height, how does, it, how does it work mechanistically? And so to answer that question, uh, there's increasing interest in studying the genetics of molecular traits. And so identifying genetic variants that, for example, are associated with changes in gene expression measurements of different target genes. Uh, people now look at genetic variants that alter uh, chromosome accessibility, uh, histone modifications or DNA methylation. And so it's important to then kind of have some background about um, how do human genetic studies generally work and how are they applied towards molecular traits? And so the learning objectives for today are basically to understand the advantages of genome-wide association studies, which kind of form the basis of a lot of the studies of molecular traits. And how does that compare to kind of classic linkage analysis? Uh, we're going to discuss when you would use, for example, Fisher's exact test versus line fitting to uh, study association with either uh, discrete phenotypes or uh, continuous phenotypes like height, for example. Uh, one of the biggest challenges historically with these kind of genome-wide association studies is dealing with what are called confounding factors. And so we'll discuss briefly what those are and how do you, uh, what are some of the basic strategies for correcting for them. And we'll also discuss a little bit about how to identify population structure and family, uh, families from genetic data so population structure is one of the biggest confounding factors of most genome-wide association studies. Uh, we'll basically look at QQ plots, which are one way that people kind of diagnose uh, uncorrected confounding factors in genetic studies. And then we'll discuss briefly uh, what the difference is between effect size and significance of statistical tests associated with genetic associations are. And so we previously discussed uh, a little bit about p-values and effect sizes. Uh, and so we'll discuss it in the context of genetics here. We'll also touch on the topic of fine mapping, which is basically related to the problem that uh, genome-wide association studies identify regions of the genome that are associated with uh, different complex traits, but they don't give you the exact causal variant most of the time. And so fine mapping is the process of identifying the precise causal variants uh, that are implicated by genome-wide association studies. Uh, and we'll talk about how, for example, epigenomics helps identify or find map uh, variants. And then we'll finish off by talking about epistasis and missing heritability. And so the key question that human genetics tries to answer in the context of this class is basically the question of where are the genetic differences that contribute to heritable diseases? And so this class in particular or is going to focus on uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, or more generally, we'll be talking about single nucleotide variants uh, or SNVs. And so those are basically variants where you just see single uh, base pair changes at a given position in the genome. Uh, but it's worth noting that there's a lot of other kind of genetic variation uh, that exists in the human population, for example. And so you can see a lot of uh, like small indels or even larger scale copy number changes uh, in different regions of the genome, but we'll more or less uh, ignore those kinds of genetic changes, mainly because a lot of these um, association analyses uh, work much better for single uh, point mutation changes. And so it's also worth noting that even though uh, one of the reasons why uh, there's historically a lot of focus on SNPs and SNVs, is that they are predominantly uh, the most prevalent kind of uh, genetic 
genetic variant in the human genome. But it's worth noting that uh, there is a large number of variants of basically larger size. And so this is basically just a plot of, a, of the frequency of uh, variants of different sizes in the human genome as estimated by the 1000 Genomes Project. And you can see that even though there's a little peak there at uh, SNPs, there is basically a lot of uh, variants at other sizes in the human genome. And so it's also worth noting that uh, the set of variants that you find uh, in the human population differs substantially uh, depending on which uh, ethnicity that you're talking about. And so this is not a pop gen class, so uh, you're going to have to take a pop gen class in order to really uh, get a grasp of uh, what we're talking about here. But basically, uh, different uh, ethnicities in the human population uh, have different effective ages. And so what that means is that, for example, in the African population, uh, the number of genetic variants observed is <clears throat> much higher uh, than, for example, Europeans. And so uh, this slide is basically just to say that when we talk about identifying genetic variants associated with different complex traits, uh, there can be a lot of hetero heterogeneity between different populations in terms of, uh, you know, does, uh, you know, not all variants affect all populations equally. And that kind of makes sense. If Africans have many more genetic variants than, say, Europeans, then there could be uh, a lot of potential for there to be African-specific variants that uh, drive phenotypic var uh, variation that doesn't exist in Europeans because they don't have that variant. And so this lecture will focus specifically on genome-wide association studies, uh, which basically involve uh, association of genetic variants to phenotypes using mostly unrelated individuals. And so that's to contrast uh, what you've probably classically learned about, uh, which is uh, association through uh, what's called linkage analysis or family-based linkage analysis. And so here, generally speaking, the idea is that uh, you're generally studying the inheritance of different phenotypes in family pedigrees. And so generally speaking, you have access to a pedigree like one shown here, and you have access to uh, at least different markers or for example, SNPs. And the idea of linkage analysis, broadly speaking, is that you are looking for uh, co-segregation of uh, both a genetic marker and for example, Z status through a pedigree. And the stronger that association is, or co-occurrence of a genetic variant with a phenotype, then the essentially the stronger the uh, link is between that particular genetic variant and that phenotype. And so linkage analysis uh, historically has been really prevalent in part because linkage analysis is, is pretty good at finding genetic causes of Mendelian disorders. And so just to recap, a Mendelian disorder is generally speaking a disorder that is driven by uh, the, like single you know, mutations in a single gene. And so this is uh, in contrast to polygenic uh, traits, which are uh, controlled and driven by many genes. And so uh, the reason for this is that in Mendelian disorders, uh, genetic risk factors are highly penetrant. And so penetrance basically refers to the fraction of individuals who have a genetic variant and also exhibit uh, a pheno the phenotype that you're studying. And so if you have high penetrance, that means that every time you see this particular variant, um, you know, you'll oftentimes see the corresponding phenotype that you're looking for. Um, that's, you know, it's also worth pointing out that you can have high penetrant variants, but that doesn't mean that every disease incidence is caused by that genetic variant. Because if that genetic variant is rare, then even if it causes the disease, every time you see that genetic variant, if it's rare, then uh, you know it, it doesn't cause, it's not responsible for the vast majority of cases of a particular disease, for example. And so unfortunately, uh, most common diseases that you've likely heard of, like cancer, diabetes, schizophrenia, uh, pretty much you name it, uh, it's, it's a complex trait. In complex traits, complex traits are, are typically uh, driven by variation in a large number of genes. And so, for example, uh, if you take like a complex trait like height, um, there are like thousands and thousands of genetic variants all across the genome that are implicated in variation in height. 
Um, and so this is obviously very different from Mendelian disorders, where it's generally speaking one gene that's primarily responsible for that trait, even though you can have modifier genes or whatever. Um, and so one of the, one of the hallmark traits about complex traits is that um, genetic variants that are associated with those traits tend to have lower effect sizes um, than uh, than in Mendelian disorders. And so what that means is that uh, genetic variants that are associated with complex traits on average don't have as much of an effect individually as they would with Mendelian disorders because, you know, in as opposed to Mendelian disorders, you have hundreds or thousands of genes contributing uh, to, to variation in this trait. And so again, one of the primary motivations of um, reviewing genetics within a genomics class is that um, a large part of the world is, is interested in not only identifying genetic variants that are associated with different diseases or complex traits, but actually figuring out how they work. And so trying to distinguish, for example, which genetic variants might just be uh, disrupting protein coding sequences versus genetic variants that, for example, change the activity level of enhancers or the locations of, say, K27 acetylation, which then subtly affect the context-specific expression of a gene in a specific tissue or set of cells, which then kind of lead to some kind of cellular or uh, organizational change in a tissue and therefore contributes to disease in some way. And so uh, genetic, human genetics is increasingly interested in studying how genetic variation affects complex molecular phenotypes like accessibility, methylation, or uh, histone modifications. And so what's kind of interesting to note is that um, up to like 15 or 20 years ago now, um, a lot of, there was a lot more knowledge about uh, different human Mendelian traits than there were about uh, human com uh, general human complex traits. And this is in large part because sequencing was, or even genotyping was still relatively expensive up until about 15 years ago. Um, now that sequencing is super cheap and so is genotyping, uh, the number of genetic variants that have been identified is being associated with different complex traits uh, is now quickly outpacing uh, the number of, for example, characterized human medallion traits. And so just to put this lecture in more of a practical context, here's a list of FDA-approved drugs whose gene targets are uh, actually supported by human genetics evidence and studies. And so you can see that human genetic studies actually has a pretty practical uh, implication on therapeutic development. And so now we'll basically discuss how, at a kind of a conceptual level, how genome-wide association studies are conducted. And so some basic uh, terms or uh, dichotomy to genome-wide association studies are, ne are needed here. So when you perform a genome-wide association study to identify SNPs associated with some uh, phenotype, how you perform those analyses kind of depends on what your phenotype or your trait looks like. And so generally speaking, if you are looking at binary phenotypes, so that's those are cases where like case control studies, where you have like, you can divide people into a healthy group and a not healthy group, um, like say normal or type two diabetic, then uh, typically you're using tests like Fisher exact test or tests like that, um, that essentially look at the distribution of people with a genetic variant and how that uh, relates to the distribution of people who have a given trait. Uh, in contrast, when you are looking at continuous phenotypes uh, like BMI or height, um, or even for, for example, uh, traits like or disease like type 2 diabetes, uh, you, some of the uh, measurements that people use to determine whether you have diabetes might be continuous. And so uh, you might try to do a genome-wide association study against a continuous phenotype, which is indicative of, say, type 2 diabetes. Then those kind of association studies basically amounts to fitting lines. And so we'll talk about what that means exactly. Uh, but we'll start with binary phenotypes because those are... Um, those essentially are what case control studies are, and those are kind of what you might classically think about when you think about uh, genome-wide association studies.
And so we already saw examples uh, of how Fisher's exact test is done in the context of gene set enrichment analysis, for example. And so here I'll just kind of briefly go over it again in the context of genetics. And so here the idea is that um, suppose that you have uh, 2,000 individuals that you're studying the genetics of uh, some binary disease phenotype of, and you are, and you, uh, these 2,000 people are divided into 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls. And now you want to ask the question, if I am looking at one particular SNP, say a biallelic SNP, in which you only see an A or G uh, across your 2,000 individuals, and you want to ask the question, is one of these variants associated with, uh, with this particular trait? Then what you would do is you would again build one of these so-called two by two contingency tables where every individual, every case and every control that you have genotyped basically has either an A. So suppose that we're looking at a uh, haploid genome for the time being. So every individual in your genome uh, or in your study has either an A or a G at a particular SNP position. And so among your cases, you can divide your cases out into the people who have A or G. In your controls, you can divide out uh, your individuals into those that have A or G. And in doing so, you can build this two by two table where you can see that the rows of this table each sum to 1,000 because there's 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls. And you can see based on the number of people who have A's or G's that A is a what's called a minor allele. Um, it's, it occurs at a lower frequency in your population or in your study population than G's. And so if you ask the question, uh, you know, which is, is there an association of either A's or G's with respect to uh, your cases? When you look at this two by two table, you can see that essentially because the rows sum to 1000, then you can easily kind of see the proportion of cases and proportion of controls that are basically uh, have the A allele in. So you can see that basically 24 over 1000 uh, is the proportion of controls that have A and 68 out of 1000 is the proportion of cases that have the allele A. And so basically the uh, A allele is present in about two and a, two and a half times uh, higher rate in the cases than in the controls. And so intuitively you can see that uh, if there's kind of no errors in the study, and we'll talk about what those errors could be in a second, then the A allele was found at a rate of, you know, two and a half times uh, higher than in the controls. And so, you know, there, there possibly could be an association between an A allele at this position and uh, the whatever phenotype you're looking at. And so if you were to do, for example, a Fisher's exact test, uh, you know, where you pretend you have an urn and you have colored balls, just like we saw with the gene set enrichment analysis test, then you would find that your p-value is something really small, like 7.3 times 10 to the negative 7. And so there, uh, if there's no errors in your study, then you could uh, conclude here that there is strong association between the A allele in this position and your case status. And so here's just uh, a more mechanical uh, illustration of the urn, urn example, uh, just like for gene set enrichment analysis. And so I won't go over it here because you can go back to the gene set enrichment analysis lecture and review it if you uh, don't remember how this works. But essentially some terms that I want to reemphasize here is that the p-value, which we said was about 10 to the minus seven, is calculated based on these simulations where we're drawing random groups of a thousand uh, individuals and asking how many times we saw an A. Um, and that's a distinct concept from effect size, where effect size basically just asks, in, in some intuitive sense, what is the relative rate of, what is the relative proportion of people with the A allele in the cases versus controls? And so that's really just 60 over 24. And so that effect size is approximately 2.8. And so that 
much uh, concludes our discussion about how people do association studies for uh, binary phenotypes. So we'll spend the rest of the lecture talking about basically association studies for continuous phenotypes. So these are phenotypes like height or uh, BMI or things like this. Um, in practice, you'll tend to find that association analysis methods, at least for association studies of unrelated individuals, um, the, the methodologies used for continuous phenotypes are much better developed in general than those for binary phenotypes, uh, in part because you'll see that it's much easier to correct for confounding uh, variables like population structure or family relatedness uh, when you use models meant for continuous phenotypes. And so what you also see in practice is that even for a lot of discrete traits, uh, like disease incidence of type 2 diabetes versus controls, um, oftentimes people actually still use the methods that uh, are meant for continuous phenotypes, mainly because they are uh, much more flexible in terms of what they can correct for. And actually, it turns out that uh, even though it mathematically doesn't really make sense, if you just kind of encode, say, for example, cases as a phenotype of one and controls as a value of zero, then these continuous phenotype methods seem to actually work quite well, even for discrete traits. And so the basic idea of an association study for uh, continuous traits is that at least for humans, for example, most humans are uh, diploid. And so obviously uh, for each given SNP in the human genome, for example, we generally, most SNPs are biallelic. And so <clears throat> uh, for any given position uh, of a SNP in the human genome, you should see uh, at most two different alleles. And so here's an example where columns represent uh, different SNPs and rows represent different chromosomes uh, for two different individuals. And so in an association study for continuous phenotypes, the idea is that for each SNP in the genome, you need to convert somebody's uh, SNPs into an actual number, right? And so the idea here is that uh, across a population of individuals for a given column or for a given SNP, you can basically choose, because most SNPs that you're going to be looking at are biallelic, you can basically pick one allele as the so-called reference allele and the other allele as the so-called alternative allele. And in this case, you can, for example, just count for each individual and each SNP position, you can just count the number of reference alleles that you see at that position. And so because human genomes are generally diploid, um, each SNP gets converted into a zero, one, or two depending on how many reference alleles you count. And say, so for example, for the individual in the top, uh, for the leftmost SNP, you can see that the reference allele chosen for that position was uh, adenine. And so because the first individual only has one adenine, then uh, his SNP at that position is encoded as a one. So here's the general idea of an association study with continuous phenotypes. So suppose that you have, you're looking at a population of n individuals, so say like, you know, 20 individuals. The idea is that for every individual in your study, you can both presumably measure the phenotype you're interested in, so in this case BMI, and for that same individual, for a single SNP, you can quantify for that SNP, whether a given individual is either a zero, one, or two, depending on uh, what, uh, depending on how many reference alleles that you found at that position for uh, their genome. And then what you can do is because you have, in this case, say for example, 20 points corresponding to 20 individuals, you can just plot a scatter plot where the x-axis is a genotype uh, of an individual at that position and the y-axis is just the continuous phenotype you're interested in. And you can basically fit a line to the scatter plot that you draw here. And so the general idea is that no matter what SNP or phenotype you're looking at, there's kind of three basic patterns you can, uh, that you can see in these kind of plots. So in the case where, for example, for BMI, 
suppose you drew the scatter plot and you fit a line of best fit. If the slope of that line is positive, so what that means is that uh, the line is is that basically means that the phenotype is increasing with every addition of the reference allele. Then in this case, you can uh, tentatively conclude that the reference allele is a risk allele because what this what a straight line in this specific case means is it means that. Uh, for every addition of a reference allele to an individual genome, there's a fixed increase in BMI. Uh, that's what this line in particular means. And so because you're, because as you add more reference alleles to an individual, you generally see higher BMI, then in this case, the T allele would be considered a risk allele because the more Ts you have, the higher your BMI is. Similarly, if the scatter plot you drew has a negative slope, and so with every additional reference allele, your BMI uh, on average seems to decrease, then you might tentatively conclude that the T allele is actually protective in the sense that with every additional reference allele that you have for an individual, you seem to notice that BMI decreases with the number of T alleles. The most common case is where you get something that looks approximately like a flat line, um, like shown here on the right hand side of the slide. And in the case where you have a flat line as a line of best fit or something that looks close to flat, then this essentially tells you that there's no significant, no statistically significant association between the reference allele and your phenotype of interest. And so in this case, the slope of the line is effectively zero. A uh, flat line essentially means a, a slope of zero. So two important concepts that you need to know about for association testing are effect size and statistical significance. So these two concepts should be getting to be very familiar for you at this point. But in this case, effect size, generally speaking, refers to the average change in phenotype per reference allele. Uh, that you estimate when you fit your line. And so large effect size is shown on the left, where, for example, in this hypothetical case with BMI, you see an average change of BMI of 10 units per reference allele, which would be huge if, if this was actually like a real SNP. Uh, on the other hand, a small an example of a small effect size SNP would be one in which there's barely any change in BMI for every addition uh, of a reference allele. And so this would be much more typical of, of obesity. And so it's worth pointing out that uh, in this lecture, oftentimes we're going to use a, the proper form of an equation to illustrate or to describe a line of best fit. And so the stereotypical way to represent a line is to write it down in the form y equals mx plus b or in this case, what I'm writing it as is the phenotype on the left, BMI, is equal to uh, beta, which I'll typically, which is the symbol I'll typically use to represent the effect size, times the, uh, basically the x-axis variable, which is represented by the SNP. And usually there's actually an intercept term, um, which sometimes I'll call beta zero, uh, which just refers to the y-intercept uh, of your line of best fit but I'm just excluding it here uh, for now, just for simplicity's sake. And so again, the, the other concept is statistical significance. So in this case, specifically for line fitting, uh, statistical significance is also termed uh, goodness of fit. And so the idea here is that when you fit a line to your scatter plot, it's possible to fit a line to any set of points uh, whether or not the line actually explains the data well or fits the points well is another issue. And so consider the two figures here on the bottom left and right, where uh, I basically fit a line of best fit through the scatter points in each case. But you should be able to see that in terms of the figure on the left, the scatter points sit fairly close to the line 
a best fit. And so the line best fit actually fits the data pretty well because intuitively the blue points are all close to the black line. And so that's in contrast to the figure on the right where it's true that you can generally see a increase in, for example, BMI with addition of different reference numbers of reference alleles. But you can see that there's pretty wide scatter between the blue points and the black line. And so intuitively, uh, the figure on the right on the right represents relatively poor fit, and the figure on the left represents relatively good fit. And so how fit how goodness of fit is actually quantified uh, typically when you're talking about lines of best fit is it's typically quantified in terms of this squared error, right? And so more specifically, uh, lines of best fit are typically calculated using what's called the least scores method. In that case, in those cases, um, what how the line is fit is intuitively uh, you look at many possible lines and you're essentially picking the line that minimizes the square difference between each blue point and the corresponding uh, point on the black line. So that's referred to as squared error. And so when that squared error is low, uh, that tends to correspond to figures like the one on the left. And when that number is big, it tends to correspond to the uh, figure on the right. And so one of the pro besides being able to uh, besides being able to test for association between SNPs and continuous phenotypes, this kind of line fitting procedure is really handy for being able to correct for kind of what's called confounding variables. And this is something that the Fisher's exact test that I talked about earlier in the lecture cannot do. And so the general idea here is that um, the the power of these kind of GWAS studies really stems from the fact that um, the original hope is that because your SNPs, your genotypes are kind of generally determined uh, at the time of conception, the idea is that if you can find real associations between SNPs and a phenotype, then those should be real in the sense that um, lots of people, for example, try to find relationships between RNA expression or chromatin accessibility and phenotypes. And even though you can find strong correlations between, say, RNA expression and some phenotype like BMI, you never know which one caused which. Because, for example, BMI, increase in BMI can, can lead to changes in gene expression and vice versa. And so even when you find correlations between RNA expression or accessibility and some phenotype, you don't know which cause which. But in the case of SNPs, what's kind of tantalizing about genetic association studies is that because the SNPs generally come before the phenotype, then potentially when you find associations, those are possibly causal, even though um, there's a very big leap of faith there um, in that kind of conclusion. And so one of the biggest challenges that people figured out uh, when they first started doing these, associ these association studies is that there's lots of confounding variables. And so a confounding variable is informally some kind of variable that can explain your association between SNP and phenotype. Uh, and that basically takes away the explanatory power of your SNP. So it basically is a variable that can say, okay, I can explain why this SNP is associated with this trait. And therefore in reality, that even though your line of best fit tells you that this SNP is correlated with some phenotype, there's some other explanation as to why this correlation exists. And so to give, you a, uh, to give you a hypothetical example of when this would happen, suppose that, and I'm not claiming this is actually true, but I'm just saying that suppose that males on average had significantly higher BMI than females. And suppose that this is for reasons other than genetics, right? And so suppose that males on average just ate much more poorly than females. And so that means that on average, if you just picked a male off the street, they would tip, tend to have higher BMI than females. Now further suppose that uh, there were certain SNPs that, uh, suppose there are certain SNPs that were better represented 
in males versus females. So uh, in this hypothetical case, suppose that the T allele, uh, which is which was deemed the reference allele here, was basically in a higher proportion of males than it was in females. Then in that case, for this particular SNP, you might your association test might actually tell you that the T allele in this SNP is strongly associated with BMI. And the reason for this is that if the T allele, if the T allele is heavily biased uh, towards males, um, you know, just because of because of genetics, then uh, there will be many more males represented in the TT genotype compared to, for example, the AA genotype, right? And furthermore, if males have significantly higher BMI than females for reasons other than genetics, so for example, because of diet, then the TT allele individuals will have a much higher BMI than the AA individuals because males have a higher BMI than females in this hypothetical scenario. And so in that case, when you draw your line of best fit, you're going to get a positive slope. And therefore, the association test is going to tell you that the T allele is strongly associated with increases in BMI. But this is a false association because um, you're only seeing an association here because the T alleles are associated with being males and being a male is associated with higher BMI. But in this specific case, uh, being a, uh, you know, males having a higher association with BMI is not due to genetics, it's due to diet. And so that's essentially, that essentially means you get a false positive here and you, and basically gender becomes a confounding variable. And so, uh, it turns out to be relatively straightforward to deal with confounding variables when you know what they are. Right? And so in this case, if you know that gender is a confounding variable because you know that males are have a higher BMI than females due to, for example, diet and not genetics, then what you can do conceptually is you can just calculate the average BMI for males. You can calculate the average BMI for females. And then essentially for every male, you can subtract off the average BMI for males. And likewise, for every female, you can subtract off the average BMI for females. And what that'll do is it'll kind of adjust the BMI value for each individual according to their gender. And then you'll get a scatter plot like what you see on the right. And now if you were to fit a line to the scatter plot on the right, where you've kind of corrected for gender specific differences in BMI, then you'd find out that you essentially get a flat line, which again means uh, there's no significant effect of genotype on BMI. And so you would conclude correctly that the genotype at this position does not is not associated with BMI. So the more typical approach to correcting for confounders uh, is by using a technique called nested models. So the idea of a nested model is that if you want to test whether or not a SNP is significantly associated with BMI beyond what you can explain using uh, a confounding variable like gender. The idea is that you want to basically fit two lines to your data. So the first line you fit is a line where you say, okay, my response variable BMI is equal to beta times one variable, SNP. And you add in a second variable for your confounding variable like gender. So you add plus beta two times gender. And so beta is the effect of your SNP and beta two is the effect of gender. And so you fit this model by uh, making some estimates of the slopes beta and beta two that maximize your goodness of fit or equivalently minimize your squared error. And then what you do is you build a second model you fit a second line where you just say BMI is just some function of gender. So you fit BMI equals some beta two times gender. And so the idea here is that the second model where you only have a gender variable fitting to BMI is nested within the first model where you have both gender and SNP. 
And it's called nested because the goodness of fit of the first model where you include snip and gender should always be at least as good as the goodness of fit of your second model. The reason for this is that no matter what line you fit for the second model, no matter what you set beta 2 equal to for the second model, you can fit an equivalent line uh, in the first model by setting beta equals to 0, by setting the effect of snip to be 0. And so what that means is that in the worst case scenario, if the snip has no explanatory power for BMI, then your first model should have should be able to explain BMI just as well as the second model because they're the same. If beta equals zero, then model one and two are the same. If the SNP has any kind of explanatory power, so if beta is anything other than zero, then your first model should have a smaller error than your second model. And so the idea of this kind of nested model approach is that you fit both model one and model two, and then you check their goodness of fit. And if the goodness of fit of model one is about the same as model two, then you can conclude that SNPs, that particular SNP you're looking at uh, does not is not really associated with BMI once you consider gender. But if the goodness of fit of model one is much better than the goodness of fit of model two, then that means that the SNP had a lot more, added a lot more value to your model than beyond what gender can add. And so that means that the SNP is associated with BMI when you condition out gender. And so in that case, then your p-value that you would calculate would be small. And so when you typically do a genome-wide association study, you don't typically, because it's genome-wide, you don't typically perform just a single uh, association test of one SNP versus a particular phenotype. You're typically testing a large panel of markers. So typically in human studies, for example, you might test anywhere between 600,000 and say 5 million SNPs across the genome. And so what a QQ plot tries to, tries to tell you is, it tries to answer the question across all of the you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of SNPs that I test, how much signal do I see? How many, approximately how many genetic variants uh, do I see as being associated uh, you know, across all the SNPs that I test. And so we talked previously about some of the problems of, of um, performing multiple hypothesis testing, uh, testing assays. And so part of the problem there is we said, well, the more uh, tests you perform, the more likely that you're going to see a small p-value by chance. And so QQPlot is basically just another way of kind of visualizing um, how many essentially false positives or false negatives might you see in your uh, across all the SNPs that you test. And so suppose that we have the following scenario where we assume that we perform say 100 association tests between say 100 SNPs uh, that are uncorrelated or unlinked. Uh, if there was actually no um, if there was actually no signal, there was suppose this trait that we're looking at has no heritability. So genetics does not explain any of the variation in the phenotypes. Then how many p-values would you expect to see that is 0 0.01 or smaller? So I want you to think about that. Um, and then we'll talk about it on the next few slides. So the answer to the question on the previous slide uh, as to how many p-values would you expect to see less than 0.01 if you performed 100 independent tests in which the null hypothesis is true in every single one of them is you'd expect to see one test with p-value less than 0.01. Similarly, you'd expect to see five p-values less than or equal to 0.05 and so on and so on. And so what that essentially means is that if you drew a histogram of the p-values that you saw from all of your tests under such a scenario where the null hypothesis is true in all of them, then you'd expect to see the uniform distribution. And so what the QQ plot is essentially is it's a scatter plot that gives you a visual indication as to how close uh, your distribution of p-values is 
to the uniform distribution. And so here on this slide, I'm showing you in the middle of the slide, I'm showing you uh, an example of an actual p-value distribution that you might get if the null hypothesis is always true and you did 100 independent tests. And the left is what you should see in theory. And so obviously, because of stochasticity, you're, even when the p-value distribution should look about uniform, it never actually does in practice. And so when you draw a QQ plot, essentially it's comparing the distribution in the middle versus the distribution on the left, and it shows you how similar they look. And so the way a QQ plot works is that essentially it what you do is you take the set of p-values that you computed over your, in this case, 100 tests, and you sort them from smallest to largest. And so that's what the table on the top of the slide does. So under the row labeled as hours, you can see the actual p-values that I got from doing this random simulation, and they're sorted from smallest to largest. And so what you can also do is that, again, you can calculate what p-values you would have expected to see <clears throat> in theory by chance. And so again, because if you do 100 tests, uh, and there, if the null hypothesis is true in all of them, then you'd expect one p-value that is less than or equal to 0 0.01, two that is less than or equal to 0 0.02, and so on and so on. And so your expected p-values from this simulation are really just 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, so on all the way to 1.0. And so a QQ plot is essentially just a scatter plot where the x-axis is uh, are the p-values that you expected to see in theory, and the y-axis are the p-values that you actually saw in your study. And so essentially what you're doing is you're taking the 2D table that I'm showing on the top of the slide, and you're just drawing a scatter plot where here, instead of just simply a scatter plot, I'm drawing a line that connects all of the scatter plot points. And you can basically see that in this case where you actually drew 100, you did 100 association tests and the null hypothesis is true in all of them, basically the line that you get on this QQ plot is very close to the diagonal. You can see the red line kind of hugs the black line. And so that this is what a QQ plot looks like when your study essentially yields no signal at all. And so in contrast, suppose that you perform a study where the null hypothesis actually gets rejected for half of the tests, right? And so here again, uh, I'm showing you the, a p-value histogram uh, or distribution on the left that corresponds to a case where all of the tests that you perform uh, are ones in which the null hypothesis is true for all of them. And in the middle is basically the distribution of p-values that you would get if half of your tests uh, are ones in which the null hypothesis uh, are rejected. And so you can see just looking at the distribution of p-values in the middle versus the left, you can see there's a strong kind of over-representation of small p-values uh, close to zero uh, that basically give you an indication that the null hypothesis was rejected in a bunch of cases. And so if you look on the QQ plot shown on the right, the red line basically corresponds to the case where the null hypothesis is true for all the tests. And again, just like the previous slide, you can see that the red line hugs the diagonal very closely. On the other hand, the blue line corresponds to the QQ plot for the uh, what I've labeled as study two, which is the p-value distribution in the middle. And you can see that the blue line is uh, deviates pretty strongly away from the diagonal. And so that kind of gives you a visual indication that uh, your, uh, your association tests are skewed towards rejecting uh, the null hypothesis pretty frequently. And so again, the, the goal of the QQ plot is really just to give you a visual indication as to how often have you been overall rejecting the null hypothesis compared to what you would expect if the null hypothesis was not rejected in all of the cases. And so the general idea of a QQ plot is that um, when you have a lot of confounding errors, like if you have um, a lot of family structure or um, uncorrected confounding variables like ethnicity that we'll talk about in a second, uh, 
then you'll tend to see a lot of enrichment. You'll tend to see a lot of really small p-values. In other words, you'll, you'll end up rejecting the null hypothesis much more frequently than you would expect. And so your, your QQ plot will deviate very strongly from the diagonal. And so the QQ plot is, is the most basic kind of plot that people use to diagnose their genetic association studies uh, because for the most part, for most traits, you don't really expect you wouldn't really expect, for example, like half the SNPs that you test to be associated with any given complex trait. Uh, most of the time you might expect, and we observe in practice, that for most complex traits you might only see, say, like 10 to a few hundred uh, genes as being, or SNPs, uh, as being associated with a particular complex trait. And so when you see strong deviation from the diagonal, you basically know that something's wrong. Uh, one of the problems with looking at QQ plots and one of their criticisms is that you might ask the question then, well, if I'm performing an association study, whether that's on a complex trait or you know complex molecular phenotype like gene expression, you might uh, you might ask the question, well, I'm I'm doing this genetic association study because I don't know how many SNPs or which SNPs are associated with my trait or phenotype, and so um, how do I know that? maybe the diagonal, maybe the QQ plot should be really far away from the line because, you know, maybe there are just like thousands and thousands of SNPs that do drive variation in the phenotype that I'm looking at. And so the question of, you know, the important question to ask here, which is that how many significant SNPs do I expect to see for a trait ahead of time, you know, before I actually see the data? Uh, the answer is that it kind of depends on the genetic architecture of the underlying trait. Um, and again, you know, because you're typically doing an association study to figure out what that genetic architecture is, this is a hard question to ask. But people have asked this kind of question for many different traits over many different years. And there are a few um, general conclusions that people have come to. So in the first kind of model, what I'm labeling here is the CDCV model. So CDV, CDCV stands for the Common Disease Common Variant Model. So this is one of the first models that were kind of proposed um, for many complex traits and diseases. And so under this model, the general expectation is that there's a small number of essentially moderate effect loci that produce very strong association signals. And the idea is that each one of these moderate effect loci actually explain a, a significant proportion of the variance of your phenotype. And so in these plots, the y-axis represents essentially the percentage of variance that a particular variant explains for a phenotype. And the x-axis just represents hypothetical chromosome position of that uh, SNP. And so you can see in the CDCV plot that basically there's a few SNPs that really stand out in that there's a few SNPs that really explain like three, four percent of the variance in your phenotype, which is, which is actually really huge. Um, and so this model actually, even though it was one of the first ones that were proposed and that was what people were thinking that they would see for a lot of complex traits, it turns out that that model is, has been refuted for quite some time now um, because people have found that there's a lot of so-called missing heritability based on these models. And so at the end of this lecture, we'll briefly mention what missing heritability means in the context of these association tests. And so in the second model, what I've labeled here in the bottom left is the rare allele model. Um, in the rare allele model, the idea is that the causal variance for a given phenotypes, so those are the variants that are uh, colored in yellow, uh, and there's very few of them. The idea is that causal variants themselves may individually have very large effect size, but the idea is that for any given, say, common disease, uh, each individual that has a particular disease might have a different rare variant. Right? And so you, even though you might have a collection of homogeneous looking type 2 diabetes patients um, that you might think, okay, there might be some common variant that is explaining all of their um, disease incidences. Under this model, the idea is that actually each person might have their own rare allele. Uh, that although they in these rare alleles individually are you know strong drivers of the type 2 diabetes phenotype, it's a different rare allele in each person. And so when you're doing these association studies that kind of rely on population level analyses, um, their each rare variance individual ability to explain an entire population's incidence of type 2 diabetes is relatively low. And so the idea on the, the rare allele model is that these genome-wide association studies will not kind of 
um, put a lot of emphasis or will not be able to reveal these yellow dots because they'll kind of get lost in the sea of other variants. And you'll notice that the y-axis in the uh, rare allele model figure is uh, much smaller than the y-axis in the CDCB model, for example. And so this is to reflect that variants in the rare allele model across the whole population don't look like they explain much proportion of the variance in your phenotype. So in the third kind of model, uh, which is shown in the top right, uh, the, this is called the infinitesimal model. And so in the infinitesimal model, the idea is that there are like a ton of common variants that all collectively uh, explain uh, some proportion of the variance uh, of your complex phenotype. And in this case, the idea is that uh, in this model, you might actually see some small peaks that correspond to small effects of some common variants. Um, and so the infinitesimal model kind of in conceptually looks similar to a rare allele model. The main difference is that you see those little peaks and those little peaks arise because there, the idea is that there are some common variants that still provide some measurable amount of explanation of the uh, variants of the phenotype. Um, and they are shared across potentially multiple individuals with the same, for example, disease. Uh, the final model, which uh, we won't spend a lot of time talking about, uh, is called the broad sense heritability model. And under the broad sense heritability model, the idea is that there's a lot of, um, the effect of a lot of alleles kind of depend on the environment in which individuals are found. And so the idea is that if you're studying the you know, incidence of a trait or disease in a population of, indiv of individuals, uh, certain subsets of individuals in this large population might exist under different environments. And so certain alleles under certain environments might tend to cause, you know, higher incidence in one disease, in a disease, uh, for example. And so because you have this mixture of people living in different environments, and there's this complex G by E interaction where some alleles only have an effect in certain environments, um, then you'll, you'll basically get a uh, kind of a washing out of signal in the sense that there'll be lots of variants that only conditionally affect uh, a phenotype. And so because you know, that's only, uh, there's variants that only affect a subset of, in, of individuals, then their essentially proportion of variants explained for a phenotype is going to be lower than, than you might hope it would be. And so genetic association studies uh, have a lot of challenges. And so the first challenge they run into is what's known as winner's curse. And so the idea here is that when you perform a genome-wide association study, what you're doing is you're repeating the test, this line fitting test that I just talked about on the previous slide on a large scale, like typically you're, you're testing like anywhere between like 600,000, 10 million SNPs for association with a given phenotype. And the problem is that typically when you perform a genome wide association test, you are testing, say your 10 million SNPs, and then you're typically ranking them by their p-value. So you're looking at either the SNPs with the smallest p-value because that's this, you know, most statistically significant SNPs or you're ranking them by effect size and you're looking at the SNPs that uh, had the largest estimated effect on the phenotype per copy of the reference allele. And so genome-wide associated studies, GWAS basically run into the problem of winner's curse where uh, winner's curse just means that the SNPs with the smallest p-value or the largest effect size uh, tend to have their effects overestimated. So the p-values are smaller than they actually should be, and the biggest effect sizes are bigger than, um, they're larger than they actually are in the real population. And so one way to understand Winner's Curse, uh, the typical, typical explanation for Winner's Curse, is, uh, is through the idea, of, it's typically explained through the idea of auctioning. Right, and suppose that you're running a blind auction in which um, you know, your auctioner is basically putting up an item for sale and anyone can bid, uh, can bid for that item. 
puts down basically writes you know everyone writes down a number uh what they think it's worth to them submits the bid and then basically the person who pays the who offer the most basically wins the auction and can buy the item and so in a typical blind auction like this um what you'll notice is that even if everyone is bidding uh bidding for an item at approximately the you know the actual value of the item right so suppose that you know you have like 100 people bidding for like a car and everyone suppose everyone is equally good at estimating the value of the car so everyone bids about the cost of the car or the true value of the car because the winner of the auction is the person who bid the most that means that the car will actually tend to sell for more than it's actually worth because if everyone's bidding about uh, the value of the car because there's always some kind of random stochasticity there there's some random variation there uh, even if everyone's bidding about the value of the car there's going to be some bidding higher than others and because the person who bid the most wins the auction then the car will sell for more than it's actually worth and so it's a similar principle with um, any kind of large-scale hypothesis testing in this case GWAS because if you're only looking at the SNPs with the smallest p-value because there's noise in how those p-values are estimated um, in part because your sample sizes are typically small then that means that your p-values are over uh, they're essentially overrated and so the other problem that GWAS tends to have is a problem called hidden confounders so I spoke previously about known confounders like gender where you know you might know ahead of time that certain genders have higher BMI than others um, and those are easy to deal with but the harder problems are uh, confounding due to things that you don't know about right and so one of the common kind of hidden confounders that people have to deal with when they do genetic association tests is basically genetic similarity and so the idea here is that genetic association studies essentially uh, basically look for correlations between genetic similarity and phenotypic similarity. So the idea of association studies is that if two people who, you know, the, if you have a case where uh, the more genetically similar two people are, the more phenotypically similar they are, and that is, essentially suggests that genetics explains phenotype. And so that's how association tests are generally, you know, that's how they generally work, even the line fitting one we talked about. And so the idea with hidden confounders is that if genetic similarity co-occurs with phenotypic similarity for reasons other than, you know, genetics explaining phenotypes, then that's, that's a problem. Um, and so to give you a few examples, suppose that you're doing an association study where you're studying families of individuals. So here you have a problem, in, and suppose you, furthermore that you're looking at a phenotype like BMI, like obesity, right? So the problem you have here is that if you don't consider the fact that you have individuals, some individuals who live together, so individuals within a family, and some individuals, some pairs of individuals who do not live together or are from different families, part of the problem you run into here is that individuals within a family obviously typically share genetics, right? You know, kids share a lot of genetics with the parents. Um, yeah, so basically people within the same family tend to share genetics, but they also tend to have certain shared phenotypes like BMI because for example, people within, people that are living together in the same nuclear family might tend to eat together a lot because the parents, for example, cook or buy out for the kids. Um, then you can have individual groups of individuals where they share similar genetics they also share similar phenotypes because everyone's eating the same thing and so maybe they have similar BMIs um, and so it might look like genetic similarity is correlated with phenotypic similarity but it's actually not driven by genetics Pe these people within the same family don't have the same phenotype because they share genetics they have similar phenotypes because they're eating the same thing and so in this case um, Again, diet is a confounder, and so if you don't know what the diets of the individuals are that you're that are in your study, then uh, you can't correct for it, and so it's a hidden confounder. Similarly, uh, problems can arise. So, again, number one, problems arise at kind of like the family relatedness level. 
Problems can also rise at a different level of genetic similarity. So consider similarity because due to ethnicity, right? And so broadly speaking, African individuals look more similar to other African individuals than they do to European individuals. And similarly, Asian people tend to look more similar genetic wise to other Asians than they do to Europeans, right? And so ethnic diversity or essentially ethnic similarity can also be a confounding factor because suppose, for example, so the example I always like to give is one of stomach cancer, right? And so if you were to, for example, suppose you were to do an association study of stomach cancer and you naively walked out on the streets of Davis and you uh, basically tried to genotype the first hundred people you found that didn't have stomach cancer and then genotype the first hundred people that you found um, that did have gen uh, stomach cancer and then you went and did an association study. If you didn't consider ethnicity, uh, you might get a lot of signal, you might find a lot of genetic signal in your study, but that genetic signal may not be real because, for example, we know that in certain uh, Asian cultures, uh, people might uh, tend to eat a lot of pickled food or preserved food. And so the problem you have there is that uh, it's, it's kind of a well-known association that the more kind of preserved or pickled food you eat, kind of the higher the incidence of stomach cancer you have. And that's primarily thought to be because um, the chemicals within pickled foods uh, tend to cause or tend to predispose you to stomach cancer, right? And so then the problem you have is that if you do this naive genetic study where you don't consider ethnicity, then what you'll end up having is you'll end up having the case where your controls have, uh, you know, if you're living in Davis, your controls would be overrepresented in, say, uh, European individuals, but your cases would, you know, it might be, for example, overrepresented in Asian individuals. And so when you do this association study, if there's any SNPs that are strongly associated with ethnicity, ethnicity and so if there's some SNPs that are um, you know uh, yeah if they're only prevalent in Asians and not Europeans or vice versa then those SNPs will look like they're associated with stomach cancer even though you know by and large they, they aren't actually and so these hitting confounders basically cause spurious results so you get SNPs you get false positives and you'll get SNPs uh, looking like they're associated with a phenotype when they're actually not and you also end up with lack of power in the sense that um, sometimes when you don't correct for these hidden confounders, you actually lose power to detect uh, real SNPs. And so, uh, yeah, just to harp on this point further, um, underlying a lot of these methods like line fitting is a fundamental assumption that you know, when you're fitting lines, for example, you're assuming that each point, each individual represented by a point is kind of sampled what's called identically and independently uh, from each other. And so essentially the idea is that no pair of individuals is more related than other pairs on average, right? And so this assumption is broken when you have studies in which there are families uh, within your cohorts, or broadly speaking, you have uh, different representations of, of different ethnicities. Um, and so those are biological reasons why uh, this assumption that people are what are called IID or independent and identically distributed can break. Um, it can also break if you have what's called batch effects. And so a batch effect is, uh, I believe we talked about this in previous lectures, but a batch effect uh, is an observation that samples that, for example, get sequenced at the same time tend to look more similar to each other than samples sequenced during different times. And so batch effects can also drive a lot of hitting confounding uh, variation as well. And so just to harp on the point again about uh, problems related to, for example, systematic differences in cases versus controls in terms of ethnicity, if your cases uh, have a significantly different proportion of uh, one ethnicity compared to the controls, uh, 
suppose you you know your cases and controls have two populations and suppose the proportion of people who are from population one or two different cases and controls then what that means is that any SNP that distinguishes population one and two will also distinguish cases and controls and therefore will also look associated in your GWAS study. And so in the same way that both the problems of winner's curse and the problems of uh, hidden confounders or data heterogeneity arise because you have, you're testing lots of SNPs and you typically need lots of individuals in your study. In the same way, the fact that we do so many tests uh, makes available to us a number of tools that allow us to detect these problems and then correct for them. So for example, uh, here's a QQ plot. So the QQ plot again is, is very important classically in GWAS studies. And so again, the, typically the first plot that people make when they do a genome-wide association study is they draw the QQ plot. And so again, if you're on average for the you know, majority of phenotypes that you might look at, particularly complex organism level phenotypes like disease incidence, you generally speaking expect that of the millions of SNPs you test, only a small proportion of them are actually truly associated with the particular, any particular disease or complex trait. And so when you test 10 million SNPs and you expect most of the, uh, most of the null hypotheses to be true, then what you expect is a QQ plot where the line is fairly close to the diagonal. And so those are represented by the green lines uh, in kind of near the diagonal of this plot. And so one, one thing you should know about this QQ plot is that in comparison to the QQ plot I drew before, the X and the Y axis represent uh, negative log 10 P values. Um, whereas I think before they represented P values from zero to one. And so the idea is the same, your QQ plot should look close to the diagonal. It's just that I want to point out that the X and Y axis are transformations of the P value. Um, so this, you know, again, uh, lines that are close to the diagonal suggest that, you know, there's not a lot of signal in your genome wide association study, which is generally um, perceived to be a, a good thing overall. Um, whereas strong deviations from the diagonal, so that's represented by the black line, um, are usually indicators that there could be potentially confounders in your association study that you didn't consider before. And so uh, when you perform an association test, it's, it's very frequent that the line that you get would be one that looks like a black line. So in this case, uh, typically what you would then do is you would then try to uh, add in, try to uh, correct for both kind of known and unknown confounders and do so in a way such that uh, you basically keep trying to correct for different confounders until your uh, black line essentially moves closer and closer to the diagonal until you deem it, uh, until you deem it uh, such that you are not essentially over predicting too many SNPs as being associated with your given trait. And so the next question you might have is, well, if Things like population structure, ethnicity, give you a lot of uh, confounding for association studies, and why not just correct for it, right? And so correcting for things like population structure and ethnicity uh, is problematic because uh, on previous slides, I showed you that one particular approach to addressing known confounders is that, well, if you know what, your, what the gender of each individual is, then you can use these kind of nested models to correct for uh, for gender. And so in a similar way, you might ask, well, you know, if ethnicity is a problem, then can't you just build a nested model to address uh, differences in ethnicity? And so conceptually, you could, um, in the sense that if you recorded the ethnicity of every individual in your study, then uh, suppose you're doing a study of BMI, and you wanted to correct for age, gender, and ethnicity, then presumably, you could build two nested models, where two models to do this nested approach. Where in model one, you just uh, fit a line for age, gender, and ethnicity. In the second model, you fit a line with some weights for SNP, age, gender, and ethnicity. And you can compare the two and then test to see whether uh, your SNPs provide more explanatory power on top of what age, gender, and ethnicity can tell you. So the problem is that uh, oftentimes it's actually really hard to 
record ethnicity is a, is kind of a variable that you can correct for in this kind of framework. And the reason for this is that, especially nowadays when you see a lot of admixture between uh, different ethnicities, and so you have a lot of individuals that are, for example, of mixed population, you know, you might have somebody that, you know, is like 25% Asian, 8% Irish, and whatever, so on and so on. Um, it's really hard then to actually, number one, get a good estimate of what those different, you know, percentages are. Number two, it's, you know, it's it's just, it, it doesn't work um, when you're dealing with populations, when you're dealing with cohorts of like millions of people. Um, getting good numbers like this is hard. And finally, even if you could correct for ethnicity by getting really good estimates of how much mixture there is, but, you know, within each individual, you still would have a really hard time correcting for things like um, the fact that people within the same family uh, share a lot more genetic similarity on average than people between different families and so on. And so we basically need a different way of um, getting a good estimate as to, you know, what a person's ethnicity is or, you know, how genetically similar people are uh, overall, as opposed to for a given stim. And so here's where uh, visualizing a so-called genetic similarity matrix uh, kind of really helps at least kind of visualize what your what the structure, population structure, and family relatedness of your of your cohorts look like, right? And so a genetic similarity matrix uh, can go by a number of different names, but essentially, what it what a genetic similarity matrix is is it's a heat map where the rows and the columns represent the different individuals in your study uh, and they're typically in the same order and the heat map basically tells you what the essentially correlation in the SNPs between any pair of individuals is and so like most heat maps that we've looked at in this class the diagonal is very prominent right and so white in this diagram means two individuals are perfectly correlated in genotype and black means they're uh, not correlated at all. And so as you'd expect, the diagonal in a genetic similarity matrix is white because each individual is perfectly correlated with themselves. I mean, that kind of makes intuitive sense. But then basically the structure of these heat maps start to look more and more interesting depending on what the structure of your cohort is. And so if, for example, you were looking at a cohort in which you have three broadly related uh, groups of individuals, so say you have like three ethnicities, say Europeans, Africans, and um, Latinos, then what you would generally see is kind of like three largish blocks on the diagonal. And those blocks correspond to the fact that individuals of the same ethnicity tend to look more similar to other individuals of the same ethnicity than to individuals of other ethnicities. And, you know, we're all humans at the end of the day. And so obviously there's still a lot of correlation between people of different ethnicities, but generally speaking, depending on which SNPs you're looking at, uh, individuals of the same ethnicity will tend to look more similar to each other than to people of other ethnicities. And so when you have three ethnic uh, three ethnicities in your cohort, you might get three kind of loosely defined blocks on the diagonal. Um, on the other hand, if you have, for example, a lot of nuclear families in your cohort, but your overall your cohort is of the same ethnicity, then you then the kind of heat map you might get would look like the one in the middle, where by and large the most prominent feature of this heat map is a diagonal. Um, but if you kind of zoomed in on on the actual heat map, what you'd see is small little more prominent squares on the diagonal. And each prominent square would typically correspond to a nuclear family. Um, and so the squares on the diagonal of a family, of a kind of a family-driven genetic similarity matrix would be more prominent than the blocks on the diagonal of an, eth you know, of an ethnicity-driven similarity matrix because um, you know, a, a parent and a child will tend to share much more similarity relatively speaking, than two people, two unrelated people of the same ethnicity. And so finally, in your best case scenario, uh, where you have no family structure and no ethnic, ethnic structure in your cohort, then the pairwise correlation matrix you would get is basically just a white diagonal with 
more or less blackish background. Um, and so that would correspond to having no population structure in your, in your cohort. And so the idea here is that the uh, genetic similarity matrix is number one, a way of kind of visualizing quickly what the structure of your cohort is for your genetic association study. And secondly, it intuitively forms the basis of um, the inputs to basically different uh, approaches like principal components analysis that can help you actually um, convert these kind of similarity matrices into covariates that you can then adjust for using some of the nested models that we talked about before. And so although on the next few slides we'll be talking mainly about the principal component analysis approach, uh, there is another approach which is more powerful called the linear mixed model, um, which can um, correct for uh, features of these similarity matrices that you see in a kind of a stronger way than, than principal components analysis. So to get an intuitive feel for how principal components analysis or PCA works, I would recommend watching one of these uh, videos. Uh, you can watch the first video if you're short on time. And so the first video is just a kind of five minute quick and dirty uh, intuition of what the outputs of PCA mean. The second video is a slightly longer 20 minute video that gives an actual detailed explanation of what PCA calculates and how the output kind of relates to the input. And the nice thing about this video is that it is explained in the uh, context of doing an analysis of gene expression data. And so it is kind of more geared towards uh, genomics. So PCA is formally what you could call a dimensionality reduction method. Uh, which in the current context, we are going to use both for visualizing your data as well as for uh, estimating some covariates they can use to correct for things like ethnicity. So the idea of PCA is that, you know, you start out, your data starts out fairly high dimensional. And by high dimensional, I mean that, you know, these genotyping assays that you use nowadays can assay up to like say 10 million SNPs per individual. And so each individual is basically described by a set of 10 million different SNPs. And so if you want to visualize, and by visualize I mean just draw a scatter plot of uh, individuals where the axes correspond to SNPs and the points correspond to individuals, it's really hard because if you're, if each individual is described by 10 million SNPs, um, it's not really possible to draw a 10 million dimensional scatter plot on a piece of paper. And so the idea of PC is that somehow it takes these high dimensional measurements of individuals and it somehow creates these um, kind of pseudo SNPs or what you might call meta SNPs, uh, which they represent as these axes PC1 and PC2 in this figure here. Um, and the idea is that variation among these principal components, PC1 and PC2, tries to capture variation between individuals in your original 10 million dimensional uh, SNP space. And so each PC axis in the principal components plot corresponds to a set of correlated SNPs. And again, the idea is that variation in PC1, for example, corresponds to variation in these correlated SNPs across individuals. And so the difference between, for example, PC1 and PC2 is that PC1 corresponds to a set of SNPs that collectively explain most of the variation in genetics between individuals. So they correspond to the SNPs that vary the most between individuals. And then PC2 is basically the second, is basically a different set of SNPs uh, that explain basically the second most amount of variation in genetics between individuals. And so again, here, PCA is a, is a method for mapping, taking as input your genetic similarity matrix that we saw on the previous slide, and basically spitting out a set of coordinates where each individual is described by uh, coordinates, and the coordinates correspond to a value in PC1, PC2, and so on and so on. And so the reason why PC is so useful is it does two things. Number one of which is that uh, if you want it to, it can, it can basically just give you a set of 2D coordinates for each individual. So it'll just give you coordinates for PC1 and PC2 for each individual. And that lets you draw a scatter plot of your individuals. 
the nice thing about this scatter plot is that because uh, PC is these kind of reduced dimensions are calculated in a way such that variation in these 2D scatter plots tries to capture the same variation that you see in the original 10 million dimensional SNP space. That means that two individuals that are close in genotype uh, across the 10 million SNPs will also look close in this PC space. And so this kind of reduced dimensionality space gives you a visualization that tries to be as accurate as possible with respect to the original data. The second thing it does is that these coordinates can actually be used as covariates or variables in your uh, line fitting models. And so suppose that, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, but suppose that somehow principal components one corresponded to uh, ethnicity of your individual. Um, so suppose that, for example, you had you were lucky and your uh, your cohort corresponded to individuals that were either 100% uh, European Caucasians, 100% uh, East Asians, or some mixture of Europeans and Asians. Then suppose for the time being that your principal component one actually gave you a number that corresponded to either zero if you're European Asian or European white, uh, you know, one if you're 100% East Asian and some value between zero and one if you're mixed, then you could actually use that as part of your line fitting procedure because you could build the kind of two models, one where you correct for just, one where you fit just age, gender, and now your PC coordinate instead of, you know, ethnicity. And another model where you fit both SNP, age, gender, and PC. And then you could compare the two models, just like we talked about before, to figure out if your SNPs are predictive even after you consider age, gender, and now PC, where PC is now your surrogate for ethnicity. And so here's an example of an actual principal components figure that you might actually get from a real GWAS cohort. And so this was uh, a figure published from one of the earliest GWAS studies uh, done in modern times. And so uh, in this particular study, uh, a number of individuals from Europe uh, were sequenced or genotyped. And because we knew their country of origin and we also genotyped them, basically what these authors did is they could draw a PC plot where they computed a similarity matrix. They ran PC, they got the principal component one and two for each individual, and then they just drew a scatter plot where each point represents an individual and the point, each point is colored by the country of origin that we knew ahead of time uh, when the study was done. And the point of this figure here is that you can see that um, the basically points of the same points of the same country cluster together on this map. What that means is that in principal component space, people that were genotyped from the same country have very similar uh, SNPs overall. And furthermore, uh, so basically the point here is that even though this principal components analysis statistical technique didn't know about the country of origin, right? You only gave it this genetic similarity matrix as input. The PCs that it spat out, in particular PC1 and PC2, give you coordinates that somehow closely resemble, or they somehow group together individuals from the same country. And so the point here is that by using PC1 and PC2 as variables in your uh, linear model, you're essentially correcting for country of origin, even if you didn't know it ahead of time when you did the, when you did the uh, genotyping. Um, and another little sort of fun observation is that if you kind of squint closely uh, on this diagram, you can see that uh, the position of individuals from different countries kind of correspond loosely to their actual geographic map position of the country. Um, this doesn't always happen, but uh, you know, this can sometimes happen if you get lucky. And so here's a plot which basically shows you on, again, kind of a real GWAS study, what happens when you don't correct for any population structure, which is, again, kind of the QQ plot uh, represented by the black line. And here you get a bunch of lines corresponding to, for example, the red line. The red line is what you get if you correct for, for example, the first two principal components on the same study. 
And so you can see that by correcting for a country of origin, um, you basically, uh, your QQ plot tells you that your uh, p-values become less and less inflated. So inflated means that you see a lot more signal than you expect. And so by bringing the black line to the red line, you basically um, lose a lot of the inflation that you saw before. Um, what do you see also on this plot, hopefully is an orange line, and the orange line corresponds to um, basically what happens if you use what I called before a linear mixed model. Um, and so the orange line is a little bit hard to see on this diagram, um, but basically the, the mixed model would actually give you an, a line that's even closer to the, to the diagonal than the PCD corrected uh, line. And so this is just to show you that um, yeah, linear mixed models tend to be an <clears throat> even better way of correcting for uh, genetic similarity matrix effects, um, but we won't go over what they are here in this class. So here I just want to make a quick point again about the multiple hypothesis testing problem. So again, just like we saw previously, uh, when you're performing many statistical tests, your chances of uh, false positives runs higher, and so you have to do some kind of p-value correction in order to address the fact that you tested multiple SNPs. Um, one thing to note is that because of linkage disequilibrium, even when you test 10 million SNPs, not all of them are independent because SNPs can be highly correlated because they get co-inherited. And so actually estimating the number of independent tests that you're doing, which then helps you do p-value correction, is actually not trivial because many SNPs are just kind of partially correlated with each other. And so calculating the number of independent tests that you did is, is not trivial, but more or less what the field of human genetics anyways has come to conclude is that uh, when you do genome-wide association studies, even if you test millions of SNPs, generally speaking, uh, people think that there's about, you should correct for the fact that about a million independent SNPs have been tested for. Um, and so uh, I think for ease of calculation sake, oftentimes people use a Bonferroni uh, style of p-value correction. And so what that means is that um, when people look for statistical significance in their GWAS SNPs, they look for a p-value, an effective nominal p-value threshold of five times 10 to the negative eight, which is what you expect if you took a nominal p-value of 0 0.05 and you divide by a million. So a really important point to make is that even the best conducted studies can still have hidden confounders that are just really hard to identify and correct for, especially when it comes to things like uh, distantly related individuals in a study that bias your results or a uh, certain ethnic or population structure that you can't completely get rid of with principal components or linear mixed models. It's generally not a great idea to believe associations or chase associations that are only reported by one study. Um, and this is true regardless of whether or not you see genome-wide statistical significance. Um, and so generally speaking, uh, the bar for seeing an association that you want to follow up on should be that you see replication in at least you know, one other or two other studies. Um, it's just, it's too easy for there to be false positive associations that are not real in GWAS studies. And so one of the problems that we haven't really talked about yet is one of fine mapping. And so suppose that we identify a variant that we think is associated with a complex trait or disease, and we're fairly sure that it's not due to some kind of confounding factor. The problem is that even once we find an association, typically those SNPs may not be and are unlikely to be the so-called causal SNP. And what that means is that basically uh, due to linkage disequilibrium, uh, SNPs are not inherited independently. Uh, and so what that means is that typically a set of variants will be inherited um, by children. And so when you're testing for an association of a single SNP against a phenotype, you're not actually really testing uh, that variation of that single SNP against a phenotype individually. You're actually testing a whole set of SNPs 
uh, basically the set of SNPs that tend to be co-inherited um, together. Uh, basically, you're testing an entire set of SNPs instead of just one single SNP. And so the reason that's a problem is that even once you find a genetic signal, you still have to do the heavy lifting to basically perform what's called fine mapping, which refers to the procedure of identifying the precise variant or set of variants that are responsible for driving that signal that you see in your association study. And so what I'm showing here is basically uh, one specific uh, locus and its results from a GWAS study. And basically what you can see is that what I've labeled as landmark SNP is the SNP that was actually tested in the association study. And what I'm listing in the top part of the graph is basically a bunch of SNPs in that uh, general locus, as well as the, uh, the negative log 10 p value of those SNPs in the original study. And so you can basically see that even though the landmark SNP gets a you know, relatively high p-value, negative log 10 p-value, there's a bunch of other SNPs in the same region that also get kind of an equally high signal. And so the job of fine mapping is to basically identify which of these, if any of these that we've seen here, is the real one. And so the heat map on the bottom uh, is basically a pairwise correlation map between pairs of SNPs at that locus. And just like the high c map, uh, basically you see blocks on the diagonal and what those blocks tend to correlate well with are basically haplotypes. <clears throat> and so a block of SNPs that are highly correlated across a population and therefore likely to be co-inherited uh, in this case uh, will tend to form a red block. And so you can basically see, you can basically visualize the problem of fine mapping here, which is that uh, even though your GWAS study identified this landmark SNP, uh, that's correlated with your phenotype. Um, there's a whole bunch of other SNPs that are highly correlated with it, and so you can't, in practice, you can't really know which one is the real one. And so fine mapping tends to be easier for some types of variants than others. And so if you're lucky and you, in your GWAS study, identifies a SNP inside a coding region of a gene, and suppose that you get really lucky and that variant suggests a non-synonymous mutation in that, uh, in that corresponding protein, then there exists a large number of software packages. For example, a popular one is called PolyFen2, which basically try to predict the pathogenicity of different coding variants. And so what that means is that, uh, you know, if you are lucky and you know the 3D structure of the protein that a variant is causing a non-synonymous mutation in, then oftentimes based on looking to see where that residue sits on the protein, so is it on the like surface, are you just changing one hydrophilic residue for another, or are you doing something really drastic like changing a hydrophobic residue in the core of a protein into something hydrophilic? Um, based on ideas like that, uh, software such as PolyFen2 will predict for you, okay, like this mutation might be deleterious, this one is not. And so it can help you sort through a bunch of local variants in that region to say, okay, well, if my p-value says this association is strong, that may likely mean that uh, this variant probably has a big effect on the protein. So which variant in this region, uh, you know, is predicted to have a big effect on the protein structure. So unfortunately, the vast majority of variants, and so by vast majority, I mean that GWAS studies of human complex traits and diseases uh, so far have more or less found that 90, somewhere between like 90 and 92% of all GWAS variants identified as being associated with traits uh, tend to sit in non-coding regions in the genome away from protein coding variants. So that's a huge problem because you know, by and large, the non-coding region of the genome is much more difficult to uh, characterize and it's much poorly, much more poorly understood in general than the coding regions. And so how people typically do fine mapping in non-coding regions is that they typically look at the locus and they look at different variants uh, around, the, around the SNP that was pulled down by our GWAS study. And they basically do like a, what you would call like an integrative 
analysis. So you basically look at, for example, uh, chromatin accessibility, accessibility assays, and you might try to identify, okay, of all the variants that could possibly be the causal variant in a given region, which ones are overlapping open chromatin regions because maybe those are more likely to be the real one. Because if you know if you have a variant that has a big effect and it's in the non-coding region of genome, if the open regions are where all the regulatory activity is happening, then maybe it's more likely that the causal variant is one of the variants that is sitting in an open region. And similarly, like as shown in this diagram, you might look at chip seek peaks from different transcription factors in that region. Uh, and you might hypothesize that, well, the causal variant, if it's in a non-coding region and if it's likely to hit like an enhancer, then, you know, maybe we should check uh, different transcription factors to see whether one of the potential causal variants is overlapping a binding site of a TF that we know. Um, and basically you can kind of go through this process and basically look at, yeah, basically chip seek data from different TFs. You might look at chromatin accessibility. Um, and later on, uh, after the transcriptal mix lecture, you'll realize that you can also look at, uh, even like look at enhancer RNAs or like enhancers which tend to be transcribed and see whether there's any potential causal variants overlapping regions that are transcribed as enhancer RNAs. Uh, here in the lower part of the diagram, uh, another common approach is to uh, look at multiple sequence alignments of related genomes. And so here again, the idea is that um, as we mentioned in the alignment lecture, sequences that tend to be conserved across time, across evolution, tend to be, you know, harboring functional elements. And so you might prioritize some SNPs that sit in highly conserved regions over uh, SNPs that might sit in non-conserved regions. Uh, if you're looking at, say, a tissue like heart or uh, say skin cells whereas if you're looking at like the brain for example maybe you wouldn't care so much about conservation because you think that uh human like the brain has evolved in humans much more quickly than other organisms uh, but generally here the idea is that fine mapping is the hard part of GWAS studies um, and because most of the variants associated with different traits and diseases in humans anyways are non-coding regions of the genome then all of those assays that we looked at for in the epigenomics lecture and uh, TF lectures and high C, um, all of those would be basically be used here to, to try to identify variants that are in kind of interesting regions of the genome where something is happening, whether that's physical interactions through high C or regulatory or epigenomic, basically using all of that kind of data to try to figure out what is, you know, which variants are most likely to be functional in this region and therefore maybe a causal variant. And so another point I want to try to make is that GWAS studies by and large are, uh, are typically underpowered. And another more positive way of saying that is that the number of genetic associations you tend to find with GWAS studies tends to increase with the number of individuals you have in your study. And so here's just an illustration of different, different real uh, GWAS studies of schizophrenia. And you can see that as the number of cases in the study increased, the number of loci they detected also increased. And so lots of GWAS studies are, are pretty underpowered. And so generally speaking, when you're looking at association studies, try to look for ones in which the number of individuals in the study is, is large, because generally speaking, they're better powered to identify associations. So just to give you a sense of how many loci around the human genome have now been found associated with different complex traits and diseases, here's a diagram of just chromosome one, actually, of all the associations that have been published to date uh, as of November 2022. Uh, and this is a picture from the EBI GWAS catalog. So basically each little colored dot represents an association uh, of a particular locus to a particular kind of trait. And you can see that even just for chromosome one, there's thousands of associations that have been found. Um, and so there's, there's lots of associations in general across the entire genome. So up until now, the type of models that we've discussed for doing association studies are what you would call additive models. And what I mean by additive models, I mean that 
by fitting straight lines to the scatter plots, what we've effectively assumed is that the effect of adding a single reference allele copy is independent of the number of reference allele copies we had in to begin with. So the effect of going from one to two copies of the reference allele is the same as the effect of going from zero to one. And so there's a large amount of work in the genetics field, which basically shows that uh, there can be a lot more different types of interactions besides these kind of like additive interactions. So for example, epistasis is pretty common as well. And so the idea of epistasis is that the effect of an allele in one locus depends on the effect of an allele found at a different locus. And so you can kind of imagine how this might happen in different circumstances. So imagine, for example, that you're looking at variants inside an enhancer and you have two different loci corresponding to uh, variants found in the binding site of, a, of the same TF. And so you can imagine that uh, whether or not, uh, if, if a TF needs to bind to at least one location in the enhancer in order for the enhancer to operate, then if the binding, if uh, the TF already has a valid binding site in one locus in the enhancer, then it doesn't really matter if there's uh, a second binding site of the same TF somewhere else in the enhancer. But if locus one already has no valid binding site in there because of a variant, then there has to be a valid binding site in the other locus in order for the TF to bind somewhere in this enhancer. And so to make a somewhat more concrete example, suppose that we're studying interactions between two loci uh, within the haploid genome, right? And so there's only one variant found at each locus in this genome. And so further suppose that at locus one across the population, you see uh, either alleles A or G, and at locus two, you see either the alleles C or T. And so my notation on the x-axis of this plot is that the allele at locus one is on the left of the slash, and the allele at locus two is on the right of the slash. And so basically by comparing different genotypes or different columns in this plot, you can get a sense of what the effect of variant in locus 1 is conditioned on what the variant at locus 2 is. So if you compare columns 1 and 3, for example, or the columns that are drawn with a black arrow between them, you can see that at columns 1 and 3, there's a C at locus 2 in both of these cases. And so the effect of locus 2 individually is, is the same. And when there's a C at locus 2, you can basically see that it doesn't matter whether you have an A or a G in locus 1, the phenotype is still the same. And so locus 1 has no effect when there's a C at locus 2. On the other hand, if you look at columns 2 and 4, which are being compared by the red arrow, then when there's a T at locus 2, then an A at locus 1 leads to low BMI, and a G at locus 1 leads to high BMI. And so basically what this means is that when there's a T in locus 2, then there is, an, there is a difference between having an A or a G in locus 1. And so this is a super basic example of epistasis because it just shows that um, when there's a T at locus 2, there's an effect at locus 1. Otherwise, if there's a C at locus 2, then there's no effect at locus 1. And so in this lecture, we didn't really have the time to tie what we were talking about here a lot back to genomics. But what I want to say about tying back to genomics and the theme of this course is that GWAS studies on their own do not give a mechanistic insight. They will give you a list of SNPs that give you regions of the genome where within each region you know that there's probably some causal variants that drive phenotypic variation in your complex traits or diseases. But they don't tell you how they do it. They just tell you that there could exist a SNP in the region that drives phenotypic variation. Um, and so nowadays, uh, I mean, GWAS, you know, finding this set of all genetic variants associated with a complex trait or disease is, you know, still obviously a big problem for a lot of traits and diseases. But one of the bigger problems that people now try to tackle in the field are basically the question of mechanism of action. 
So how do genetic, how do these genetic variants uh, within these kind of regions, um, how do they work? And so how people do that is by basically doing GWAS studies where you swap out the phenotype. So instead of the phenotype being something like, you know, disease incidence at the organism level, uh, you would actually test for association between genetic variation and molecular phenotypes. So you could use, uh, by using, by performing assays like RNA sequencing for gene expression or, uh, you know, chip seq for histone modifications or even uh, things like yeast 2 hybrid so on to get interactions or regulatory networks for interactions, um, you can actually find associations between genetics and a lot of the different types of assays that we've talked about in this class. So pretty much almost every functional assay that we talked about in this class, you could measure genetic associations with it and people have done it. And so uh, we talked about human genetics in this lecture, mainly just to get you guys used to the idea that association studies are not just for kind of organism level phenotypes like disease, they're also for molecular phenotypes as well. So the final point that I want to touch on is that of missing heritability. So the idea here is that uh, if you want to study what the impact of genetics overall is on phenotypic variability uh, for complex traits and diseases, one way you can do this is by performing a twin study, right? And so by looking at genetically identical or nearly identical individuals and by studying what their discordance is in terms of, for example, disease incidence, or differences in complex traits, you can guess with pretty good accuracy what the proportion of variance of a trait is that can be explained by genotype. And so informally, that's what people refer to as heritability, is the proportion of variance of a trait that is due to genetics. Um, and so there's specific kinds of heritability, like broad versus narrow sense, but intuitively, you're just asking what proportion of the variance of a trait is due to genetics. And so intuitively, if you recall back at, earlier in the lecture, I talked about the goodness of fit of a line, right? And I said for a single SNP, um, you can fit a line to the you know, genotype versus phenotype scatter plot, and you can measure in some sense the error of that line of fit, where large error corresponds to big scanner, the blue points around the black line, and small error basically leads to small scanner, the blue points around the black line. And so intuitively from that diagram, you can get the sense that if the genotype of an individual at that particular position is a strong predictor of the phenotypic variation, then the scatter is going to be small, right? And so similarly, the idea here is that for trait, if, if you know that a trait based on twin studies is very heritable, that means that when you're essentially predicting the phenotype of an individual based on genotypes, kind of in, you know, in an analogous way to our line fitting procedure, that means that you should be able to predict someone's disease instance for instance, fairly well with genotype and therefore there should be small amounts of scatter of the blue points around the black line, right? And so another way of saying that is that if you have an estimate of the heritability of a trait uh, based on twin studies, then that should tell you about what the error is of your line of fit in some sense. So I'm, I'm really abusing the analogy to the line of fit here, but I think the intuition is 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 right here. And so basically the more heritable a trait is, then the tighter you should see the points scatter on the black line, right? The black line should be a better and better fit of the, of the blue points essentially. And so missing heritability refers to the fact that for most complex traits, the scatter we see around the black line is greater than what we'd expect based on the twin studies. And so the twin study says that genotype should be able to accurately predict phenotype very well, but based on our line fitting procedures, it doesn't predict very well at all. And so that difference between what we expect 
uh, what kind of goodness of fit we expect based on twin studies, which I'm referring to as E twins. When that is much smaller than the error that we actually observe based on genetics, so that's E observe, then that's that's when we say there's missing heritability because we know that we should be able to explain phenotype better based on genetics, but we're currently not able to. And so there's, you know, still longstanding arguments in the field of human genetics as to why he, why missing heritability exists. Is it a function of the fact that our uh, GWAS-based studies are just poorly powered? Do we just not have enough people? Or is our model of association testing and phenotype prediction just bad? Like, are these linear models just poor explainers of phenotypic variation? And do we just need better models that, for, for example, account for more epistasis or things like this? And so, yeah, so some final thoughts I'll leave you with are that, you know, number one is missing heritability, a problem of power. Do we need more people in our studies or do we just need better models? Um, Another point I really want to drive home is that, again, most of the variants associated with complex traits and diseases in humans are in non-coding regions of the genome that are, that are, you know, unannotated for the most part. And so one of the huge open questions in human genetics is, you know, what are they doing? And so the answer is, you know, is probably going to be found in large part by using a lot of the assays that we talked about in the class from epigenomes, transcriptomes, nuclear organization to help find map variants and, and answer the question, what does each of these potential variants actually do at the molecular level?